um, I've got to collect my thoughts here because of the really interesting talks and uh, all of this uh, input. Um, so just so that I can relax a little bit and try to get back into my own paper, um, I work across literature and philosophy. Um, and I'm really interested at the moment in philosophy of emotions um, and moral psychology specifically. Um, and one of the um, uh, questions that I'm really interested in is how can emotions be incited to change norms, change attitudes, and, and motivate certain actions, right? So um, why disgust? Um, well, disgust it seems to be a very big part right now of political discourse. Uh, people are talking a lot about disgust and the way that disgust uh, kind of draws boundaries and hierarchies among communities. Um, so this is the way that disgust is um, conceptualized philosophically as well as um, in terms of how we talk about it in the news and so forth. So, you know, um, that's something that I'm really interested in, in, um, in thinking about. Um, but here's the problem with that way of thinking about disgust. Let's put ourselves back um, when we were watching television, the news, and we were watching those horrific uh, video of uh, Derek Chauvin putting a knee to George Floyd's neck. And my own sense and intuition that moral disgust is, a, is an appropriate response, right? Um, you know, and so, so call that in your mind as you know, the legitimacy perhaps of that um, response because that's something that I'm gonna uh, argue for is that disgust is sometimes legitimate. Okay, so um, I, I go to Twain because, I mean, as we've been um, kind of thinking a lot in terms of how we've conceived this panel, I, I also think that Twain does some philosophy of emotions and is uh, also interested in moral psychology, um, the role that the artist can play in kind of inciting these social changes. Um, and this all relates a lot to what Elizabeth was talking about in terms of um, the role that the artist might, might play in terms of defamiliarizing and get us, getting us to think about our norms in a different way. Um, and so, so I wanna say yes, you know, Twain is endorsing disgust. Um, the main uh, proponent of the position that disgust is not a legitimate uh, response um, is not Martha Nussbaum. So Martha Nussbaum is drawing on the work of Paul Rosen and his colleagues who came up with this animal remainder account of disgust. So, you know, um, Professor Goldman, Alan, he was talking about um, the fact that emotions have cognitive content, right? Their evaluations, all of a target. Um, and with disgust, it seems like with the animal remainder account, the evaluation of the target is of something being animal-like and more specifically being kind of like a pest. Um, it's, the uh, literature is a little bit confused about this, it, uh, but the basic idea here is that we're repulsed by the human body, the animal-like attributes of the human body, and Martha Newsman just kind of runs away with this and says disgust is at the root of racism, at the, at the root of misogyny specifically because of our overall disgust towards um, the body and women are associated with the body and bodily processes and so forth. And then you project these feminine disgust properties onto other groups like um, Jews and blacks and so forth. And then you've got disgust as like a really problematic emotion, right? So she says, no, it's not legitimate because um, it's unproductive. Um, we should not be projecting disgust onto, onto moral transgressors. And she says, sure, the pro-disgust people will say, well, you can project disgust to practices, right? And that seems to be like our intuition. Like I can be disgusted by animal cruelty and I don't have to dehumanize the other. Uh, but that doesn't fit with this account of what philosophers call a formal object of disgust, which is that it is this kind of a evaluation of the target as animal-like. Okay, so, um, so I'm saying this does not explain legitimate expressions of moral disgust. And Twain is actually um, giving us good reasons for, for uh, thinking about that and for um, uh, uh, realizing that disgust is actually very, can be very productive and that part of this animal remainder account is, is uh, confusing things a little bit because I think other emotions are a play that dehumanize and that create hierarchies, chiefly contempt, which, you know, when we feel contempt for someone or for, for a practice, we feel that we're better than, right? So contempt, um, uh, when you think about it in this way, contempt would be more about asserting values, your beliefs as being better than those other people's beliefs or you know, my way of living is better than that other way and so forth. And when you combine that with disgust, then you get like racism, misogyny and so forth, right? 
But that also explains, for example, philosopher Kate Mann's intuition that when it comes to misogyny, this, you know, um, you don't have to dehumanize the woman to experience and express misogyny towards a woman, right? Um, because because you can feel contempt for for her. You can feel contempt. You don't have to feel disgusted. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm giving you a little sense of uh, an influential paper by Haight and Rosen. So Rosen is kind of looming large here, a psychologist who works a lot on disgust, uh, and he comes up with this idea of core disgust, which um, based on psychological studies. Um, Actually, as she mentioned, that Martha Nussbaum doesn't think that core disgust is an emotion because Paul Rosen associates it with kind of a sensation of nausea and so forth. And she doesn't think that emotions are the sensations. And I think you agree and I agree with her as well about this. Um, although I'm not a, um, I don't endorse the theory broadly, but, but I do agree that um, emotions are not just bodily sensations nor perceptions of bodily sensations. Um, and, but, but you know, both uh, Rosen and then Nussbaum, by extension, say, well, okay, so you've got this avoiding mechanism, right, which, we have, which evolved to protect us from harmful pathogens. So you know, we're disgusted by dirty things because we don't want to be contaminated and potentially become diseased. So this is kind of like an evolutionary adaptation. Um, but um, in humans, so this is thought to be a uniquely human emotion, which again, I disagree with. I do animal studies. Um, animal morality, and I also do, I'm really interested in animal minds, and certainly when uh, you read, for example, Don Prince in Songs of a Gorilla Nation, she gives these anecdotal evidence, these anecdotes of gorillas literally not, not wanting to step in mud, feeling disgusted by the mud, you know, in, in the way that we would feel disgusted if a cockroach landed on us. Mm -hmm. um, and so the animal remi remi reminder account um, it is basically saying, well, there's like a more of a symbolic significance around disgust. Um, humans um, want to actually draw a boundary between themselves and other animals, and so they create all these rituals to purify themselves from their animal-like attributes. So, like you know, the, that this is why you know they explain that you know there are all these hygiene practices where you, like you have to keep things clean, and then you know that extends to like um, other kinds of practices that are thought to be. Um, more animal-like, right? And so then it blows up into like socio-moral um, disgust, which then you get into things like, well, you know, um, cannibalism, incest, and bestiality, all of this stuff makes us less than human, right? Um, and so all of this that then gets applied to other cases that are a lot more, you know, uh, bigoted and controversial, like for example, uh, projecting disgust onto um, uh, groups of humans, like, um, as I was mentioned before, homosexuals, Jews, women, and so forth. And so this is what Martha Nussbaum says in uh, Hiding from Humanity. So powerful is the desire to cordon ourselves off from our animality that we need a group of humans to bound on ourselves against, to come to exemplify the boundary line between the truly human and the basically animal. So, you know, we're repulsed by all kinds of bodily uh, products, and because we're such tribal creatures, so this is going back to Alan's point about tribalism, we are going to use disgust uh, to generate these um, self-other distinctions to exclude transgressors from moral communities uh, and so forth. Now I think that um, the story is a little bit more complicated. I mentioned contempt, um, but here's a passage I think that um, would probably elicit uh, moral disgust in uh, some of us, maybe most of us. So this is from a dog's tale. Um, so um, here's the passage uh, told from the perspective of the dog, um, the mother of the puppy, who becomes the subject of an experiment. And this also happens within the domestic sphere, as you might remember. Um, and um, so let me just read it. They discussed and experimented, and then suddenly the puppy shrieked, and they sent him on the floor, and he went staggering around with his head all bloody, and the master clapped his hand and shouted, there. I've won, confess it, his heels blind as a bat. And they all said, it's so, you've proved your theory, and suffering humanity owes you a great debt from henceforth. And they crowded around him and wrung his hand cordially and thankfully and praised him. So, you know, we might be tempted to think here that, okay, you know, maybe what Twain, uh, Twain is doing is what, like, you know, people from the Humane Society and others were doing, which is that he's using disgust to kind of 
police this boundary between like civilized and uncivilized, right? So during this time period, animal um, rights activists would refer to these moral transgressors who abused and uh, tortured animals, animal cruelists. Um, but the picture gets a little more complicated because he, he um, this practice gets endorsed by the community. He's praised. And so the horror is that we, we are allowing these practices to happen. So there is no division between the self and the other. What he's doing is he's telling us, you know, we're, we're all complicit in this. Um, we are endorsing this practice and we're no better than the moral transgressor. So I, I turned to 10,000 years among the microbes because I, actually Matt Siebel, Siebel, is that how you say his last name? Yes, he suggested this. And this actually, again, after our conversation through my Quarry Farm Fellowship, I went ahead and read this and I thought, oh my God, I'm wrong again, <laughs> always. Um, and uh, so I have this passage here from, uh, from, the, from the unfinished novel. Um, of course, we might remember that the story is told from the perspective of Huck a cholera germ who used to be a human, but who now inhabits the mode of being of a germ. But he still remembers being a human, but being a human is kind of unfamiliar to him in some sense. So in that sense, it's kind of functioning in the same way that Liz was talking about, the kind of defamiliarizing de de um, um, uh, uh, the, the human point of view, if that makes sense. Uh, and this is what the, um, so he's having this uh, dialogue with his uh, cholera friend. Um, and uh, so they're talking about how, you know, we call our creatures have like these germs as well that are gnawing on us and feeding upon us and rotting us with disease. Um, and then there's this meta reflective commentary that comes and he says, he did not suspect that he also was engaged in gnawing, torturing, defiling, rotten, rotting and murdering a fellow creature. He and all the swarming billions of his race. And then he goes even more meta reflective, right? He says, man is himself a microbe and his glow a blood cor cor corpuscle drifting with its shining breath of the Milky Way. So all of a sudden he's saying, hey, you think you're better than those germs? You're not. You yourself are the germ of something else. And so it becomes kind of um, just a way of, of defamiliarizing you with like one you know, step further, like, you know, like, a, like almost like a ladder, um, to the point where, yeah, you realize, you know what? It's going back to some of what we've been talking about before, the moral sense, the problem with the moral sense, which is that it, it enables us to do uh, wrong. And so I, I cut this out from, from the talk and I'm happy to talk about this um, a little bit further, but um, I, I think that might be the, one of the reasons why um, Huck doesn't make moral progress um, because um, um, he is kind of like um, um, naturally um, uh, cooperative, um, he has these social instincts, and he, his heart is in the right place, um, but he hasn't done this work. Um, and I think I agree with Liz that maybe that's, that's the way to do it. Um, so conclusion. I, I think contempt is the emotion that polices boundaries for the reason that I outlined earlier, um, because it creates a, um, a kind of sense of superiority over the other, and I think that when co-experienced alongside disgust, so call it contempt-driven disgust if you want, um, it becomes the engine of exclusion, okay? Because then that's when you go, you don't say, I'm morally disgusted by this practice, I'm actually morally disgusted um, by this person, and so it's dehumanizing. <coughs> um, and, um, and this is one of the things that Martha Nussbaum says, no, 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 we can't do, but if we pull it apart and, and we realize that there are two, work, uh, two emotions doing the work at the same time, then it all of a sudden makes disgust a more productive. Disgust is the defamiliarizing engine, as I've been trying to say, uh, because what does disgust do? It makes you want to distance yourself from, uh, from the object uh, of the target of the emotion, right? Um, but in that distancing, all what you get the, it is, is a realization, a disgust that's um, directed at the self. Simon Blackburn, he, he calls this shame. And isn't it Twain who said that man is the only animal that blushes, right? You get shame. But shame is not a good place to, to linger. Shame is a good place to reflect. Um, and uh, when you read the passages then of a bloody puppy, you, you, feel, you can feel shame. But then ultimately, um, what Twain, I think, seeks to incite is anger and guilt. So it's always directed inward and outward. And these two emotions, 
um, I, I think are uh, more productive. Anger, of course, there's a huge literature we're interested on, the, uh, on anger as a political emotion, on anger as an instrument for changing norms, right? Like anger and the role it plays in activism. And just as an aside, just thinking back about the racism panel, the, the N-word panel, I was gonna say that this is also very contextual as well, because I, I don't wanna generalize and say that contempt is always legitimate, but I do think that when it's combined with disgust, I, I think it might be. And that's sort of a, um, a, th a hypothesis that I have right now. I'm still working on that. So if you have any thoughts um, and you think that that's not the case, I'd love to hear your reasons. So thank you so much.